First, we have platoon headquarters. Platoon headquarters, cut! Then, number one section. Number one section, cut! And next to them, number two section. Number two section, cut! And next to them, number three section. Number three section, cut! I am armed with a pistol and 12 rounds of .38 ammunition. I also carry binoculars, compass, whistle, watch, message pad and pencil, field service pocketbook, and map. When required, I also have a very light pistol with the requisite number of cartridges, signal, or otherwise. I am the platoon sergeant. I am armed with rifle, bayonet, and 50 rounds of SAA and pouch equipment. I also carry binoculars, map, compass, and whistle. I assist the platoon commander in commanding the platoon. I take over the platoon in his absence. I am the platoon commander's servant. I am armed with rifle, bayonet, and 50 rounds of SAA in pouch equipment. I am the platoon runner. I am armed with rifle, bayonet, and 50 rounds of SAA in pouch equipment. I have a bicycle. I'm under the direct orders of my platoon commander. We are the modern detachment. We are both armed with rifle, bayonet, and 50 rounds of SAA and pouch equipment. I carry the two-inch mortar. We both carry a number of bombs, smoke, and HE in utility pouches. A number of signal bombs may also be carried. Next to them is number one section, ready for movement. I am the section commander of number one section. We are armed and equipped in the normal way for movement. I am armed with a Thompson submachine gun and ammunition. I also carry a monocular. My job is to lead the section, control and direct its fire in action. I am the fire of the gun. I carry the gun. Wallet, 50 rounds of SAA, three magazines for the gun. My rifle is in the gun chest on the platoon throat. I fire and maintain the gun in action. We are numbers two and three in the section. We are armed with rifle and bayonet, 50 rounds of SAA, and three magazines, Mark 7 for the gun. Both of us carry a pair of utility pouches. Our principal duty, under all circumstances, is keep the gun supplied with ammunition. We are the remainder of the section. We are armed with rifle, bayonet, and 50 rounds of SAA. We each carry three magazines of Mark 7 ammunition for the gun. Our duties are ammunition carriers, scouting and protective duties, and to act as riflemen when called upon. Hand grenades are carried by us when ordered. Next, number two section, ready for defense. I am the section commander of number two section. We are armed and equipped for movement as number one section. When in defense, the sections have the following additional items of kit. Spare barrel, tripod, magazine filler, and one magazine. Extra SAA as ordered by the platoon commander. Picks and shovels and matchet as required. Three pairs of utility pouches. And then number three section for movement with the anti-tank rifle in their possession. I am number three section commander. The platoon commander and his orders have deeded number three section to carry the anti-tank rifle. Therefore, two men in my section have been ordered to carry out this duty. We are the anti-tank riflemen. We are both armed with rifle, bayonet, 
and 50 rounds of ammunition. We carry the anti-tank rifle and 40 rounds of anti-tank ammunition in magazines, which are carried in utility pouches. Our brand magazines have been distributed among other men in the section. My duty is to fire the rifle. My companion has observation, controlling, and protective duties, and also carries my rifle when in action. Finally, may I remind you that the strength of the infantry rifle section is 10 men in addition to the NCO. This increase leaves a margin to cover absence, sickness, etc., and should ensure a section going into action with seven men and the section leader. We will now watch our platoon actually in action. The situation is something like this. Our forces pushing through to a definite objective off the right-hand end of the map, here, have come into contact with the enemy. There are no tanks with them, and they are fighting their own way forward. The leading companies of infantry are deployed, and our platoon is a leading one of a forward company, with other platoons on its right and left. The platoon is coming through this wood, and here is the approximate axis of advance, past these buildings, towards this hill with two trees. Bear in mind this map with particular attention to these features. This copse, this feature with two trees, we will call it the trees, and this hill which is called Scrubby Hill. An enemy post will be met with at the trees, and we are now going to see our platoon deal with it. This will give you some idea what it looks like on the actual ground. Note the copse, the trees, and the Scrubby Hill. The platoon, covered by its scouts, has reached the edge of the wood. Up to now, it has been moving in close formation owing to the thickness of the cover. Now the platoon commander decides to move in arrow head, as the country is open, the situation vague, and this formation is best suited to meet any unexpected situation which may occur on either flank or to the front. Here is the leading scout belonging to the point section. He is securing his first barn. The leading scout is always covered by a second scout who is watching his advance. The first scout has now established himself on his first barn. He turns round and gives the no enemy in sight signal to his second scout. The second scout now comes up and joins the first one, and the bound is now completed. They discussed their next move, and the second scout signals back to the commander of the point section, no enemy in sight. Here is the point section, moving down behind the scouts. The leading section moves forward, keeping one well under cover along the edge of the field. Behind them comes platoon headquarters. Note the bicycle. The runner keeps his bicycle as long as possible. Note also the two mortarmen and the equipment they are carrying. The rear section follows platoon headquarters, thus completing one leg of the arrowhead. And here is the right flank section going down the other side of the field, forming the other leg. They are moving down the hedge in file, as this formation is best suited to the ground they've got to go over. We will just revert to the map a moment. Here is the first bound secured by the scouts. The platoon is proceeding down either side of the field. Two sections and platoon headquarters, as we saw, along this hedge the other section along this hedge. The scouts will now make their next bound, which will include the cottages. Here are the cottages, slightly to the flank of the platoon's line of advance. The leading scout has noticed this and moves off, covered as usual, by the second scout to make a thorough search of the area before signaling his platoon forward. Here we see the scouts moving over close country 
working from viewpoint to viewpoint. The distance between viewpoints always varies according to whether the ground is open or close as it is in the case of these cottages. It is most important that cover of this nature should be thoroughly investigated before the platoon moves forward. You will now see an example of a short viewpoint. The right hand section has meanwhile come to a piece of open ground. Note that the section extends to arrowhead to pass over this exposed area. Should they come under enemy fire, they are unlikely to receive as many casualties as would be the case if they moved in a closer formation. The section leader carries a Thompson submachine gun. It is essentially a weapon for dealing with targets which make their appearance suddenly. It can be fired from the hip on the move, making it a useful weapon for the assault. Now let us see exactly where we are on the map. The enemy will remember are here, while the platoon, advancing in arrowhead formation, has reached these points. The right section here, the point section in advance here, and the left section here. The scouts are moving along this line. As the scouts continue their advance, no enemy is seen. If the enemy occupying the machine gun post are cunning, they will not fire at the scouts, but will wait for the leading section. This is what they are doing in this case. They are waiting until they get a sitting shot. It is therefore most important that troops, when coming out into the open, should not be bunched. Otherwise, against a well-trained enemy, casualties are likely to be heavy. The leading section now comes into view following their scouts. Note their change of formation to an open extension after they have come out of the close country. The enemy machine gun that now opens fire and one man is hit. The section at once goes to ground. Here the section gets down at once under cover and the casualty is pulled in. His ammunition is collected and distributed amongst the section. The section commander, meanwhile, cautiously moves off and looks round to spot where the fire is coming from, and also to find a position from which he can get his Bren gun into action. Any movement in this area draws fire. Rapidly choosing his gun position, the section commander now waves up his Bren gunner. The enemy now has the area under close observation and are firing at anything that moves. Then the section commander explains to his gunner from under cover the enemy position. Ball, push. Five first. On. Clear. The second scout rejoins the section and takes up a position from which he can protect the right flank. This man, looking to the rear, is keeping platoon headquarters under observation. The gun engages the enemy, fed with ammunition, by the number three. You can see him coming into the left of the picture, well under cover. And here is the other scout calling back to cover the left flank. Meanwhile, the platoon commander has come up with his runner. What's happened, Sergeant Hicks? Sir, there's an enemy machine gun by those two trees over there. The fire is heavy, 
and I can't advance direct without casualties. My plan gun is engaging the target from over there. Shall I try and work on the flank and get at them? I think I can do it quicker with the other two sections, leaving you to cover us with fire. When you see my signal, a white very light. Run up! Sir! Tell the platoon sergeant and the other two section commanders to meet me here. I want the two-inch mortar, nine rounds of smoke, play cheese. Got it? Yes, sir. What's your message? Sir, platoon sergeant and sector commanders to meet you here. Bring the two-inch mortar, nine rounds of smoke, and eight the red cheese. Right, off you go. The platoon commander is now going to write a message out to send to his company commander. The enemy, you will note, was still firing at any movement in the area. Sir, I got the sector commanders and the platoon sergeant. Take this message to the company commander. Sir. I want you all to take a quick look at the ground. There's an enemy machine gun post to our front, which we're going to attack. You must all look over this bank one by one, very carefully, as I don't want to draw more fire than necessary. When you look over, you will see two lone trees about 400 yards away. The enemy post is there. Note to your right, a copse. Take a look, Sergeant Jones. Sir. You see it? Sir. Right. Is that clear, Sergeant Jones? Sir! Sergeant Jones? Sir! Sergeant Price? Sir! Right, things are getting a bit hot here. We'll move off down the hill where I'll give out my orders. Come on. We'll now turn back to the map for a moment. The enemy post is firing from here. The platoon commander has just made his observation from Scrubby Hill. Here. The section is under cover here, and this is the Bren gun position. The number two section and number three section here. It should be noted that once the main features have been pointed out, and if the viewpoint is an exposed one, it is better to get the reconnaissance party under cover for the actual issue of orders. If this is not done, they will probably lose valuable lives, and the initiation of the attack will be considerably delayed. I'm now going to give out my orders. So pay attention. An enemy machine gun post has been located at those trees you've just seen. Number one platoon will attack and capture the position. Number two section and number three section will advance through the covered approach afforded by the cops and will attack the position. They will be under my command. Number one section will remain where it is and cover the assault with fire. You, Sergeant Jones, will select a position for the two-inch mortar and will then pass these orders on to number one section. When the attacking sections reach the far end of the copse, number one section will open rapid fire for 30 seconds and the two-inch mortar will put down smoke over the enemy position. Your signal for this is one very light which I shall fire. When the covering fire stops, numbers two and three sections will go in with the bayonet on my command. Anti-tank rifle with number three sections. Sir. On capture of the position, number one section will move up and the platoon will secure the position before resuming the advance. Any questions? Sergeant John? No, sir. Sergeant Price? No, sir. Sergeant Jones? No, sir. Here comes the platoon sergeant, bringing up the two-inch mortar. He selects a position with a view to good observation and good cover.
He now moves up to number one section commander to pass on the platoon commander's orders to him. The two-inch mortar is ranging with HE. HE is used as it does not obscure the target. It is also lethal. We now turn to numbers two and three sections, who are moving forward to the position from which they're going to put in the assault, that is, from the cops. Here is one of the sections moving across the open in arrowhead formation. The Thompson guns are with the leading men, so that they can engage rapidly any enemy who may appear suddenly, either on the front or on their flank. The Brens move slightly in rear of their section. Here comes platoon headquarters, changing their formation according to the ground which they are moving over. You can see the right hand section in file moving down the head. They have now entered the cops, and their formation has closed up. Control is the governing factor in close country like this, and this formation is the best to give it. The enemy still has his attention fixed on the covering section. He is firing at any movement that he can see. The attacking section have now reached their assaulting place where they're going to start from. There goes the very light. The covering section on Scrubby Hill opens rapid fire. Simultaneously, the two-inch mortar opens fire with smoke. Smoke produced is the result of two bombs. You can see that the screen is quite effective. So the position at the moment is like this. Here are sections two and three, ready to go in with a bayonet. Number one section giving covering fire here, maintaining its rapid fire. The two-inch mortar from here is laying down smoke, which is drifting across here. The attacking sections have reached the jumping off place. There's the attack going in now. No bunching, as a good extension, enables one to negotiate obstacles more rapidly and obviates heavy casualties. Thompson machine guns are well forward, and the Brens, which cannot really take part in the assault, are following up slightly in rear, ready to cover the reorganization or to come into action should there be any check. The post is now captured, and the platoon will reorganize. The Brens are pushing forward to cover this reorganization, whilst the anti-tank rifle gets into position to cover the open ground on the left, which appears to afford a possible line of approach for enemy tanks. The platoon commander writes a message to his company commander, which he sends back by his runner, together with the prisoner and identifications of enemy dead and wounded.
Here you are, sir. Identity desk and papers. Here, Millet. Take this message, these papers, and the prisoner back to company headquarters. Off you go. What you've just seen is one method employed by a platoon when attacking under support of its own weapon. Every situation must be dealt with in the light of the circumstances and in accordance with the object of the operation. In this case, it might have been possible for the leading section commander to have found a way around and for the whole platoon to have passed by this locality using the covered approach on the right and to have gone on, leaving it behind. They might even have attacked it from the rear using the same covered approach. Alternatively, the platoon commander, realizing that speed was essential, might have dispensed with orders and led his right and reserve sections through to attack from the flank, leaving the other section to conform. This is a matter of training. The film shows very clearly the drill for staging a quick platoon attack on a small locality. It brings out excellent lessons of how to command, use of ground, cooperation, and the correct application of firepower. Success in this type of operation is based first on a knowledge by all concerned of its object. Secondly, by a quick grasp of the situation by all leaders, followed by a simple plan with clear and brief order. Finally, success is gained by all ranks, having confidence in themselves and their weapons, coupled with a grim determination by each man to do his job and push on.